Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. So for the past two months or so, we've been looking at this topic of dispensationalism. And today we come to the final dispensation. We considered the beginning part, the foundation of all this, the the, the belief structures behind it, with the uh, distinctives that are behind it, and we'll look at those real quick here, um, that what all goes behind there, that, that quote-unquote a dispensationalist is an individual who believes in that a literal interpretation of the Bible, that when God said something, that he actually meant it. And so this morning in the Bible reading, Revelation 20, we read about this period of a thousand years. And as we'll look at as we go, but this really becomes the culmination of a lot of debate and theology, whether this thousand years actually exists or not. But if you note that in this, that that God, speaking to John, refers to the thousand years numerous times. And, and within that, he talks about individuals who hadn't received the what? Mark of the beast, which back in Revelation 13 and such, and we potentially will see some of that quickly today, that those things are there. And so there's all this debate on whether that really is true. Is it literal or isn't it? Is there really a thousand year reign of Christ or isn't there? If you just read the Bible and you believed that the author, whoever it was, really meant what they said, what would you believe? Yes, there's a thousand years. Because they continually refer to this thousand years and they never give you any indicator that there's any spiritualization that's going on with this. But there is, again, when I talked about the covenant theology and reformed theology, okay, there is in that grouping, they believe in what's called amillennialism, okay? The Greek word a, the letter a for us, means not. Millennial is a thousand years. So there's this group that's called amillennials who do not believe in a millennial reign of Christ. They take this spiritual, okay? They believe that it's a spiritual reign, and there is a spiritual reign. Christ is reigning spiritually in our hearts right now. But they don't believe also in what we're going to be looking at, and you have on the top of your bulletin on the uh, the order of service from talking about the battle of Armageddon, okay? And we won't be really looking at that. That verse that's there, okay, that's the, the, I put that there because that shows you when all the nations are gathering together in a place called Armageddon, okay, Armageddon. We'll look at Revelation 19, where when Christ comes and he does, does the battle and destroys them, okay? But you have to make a decision then. Is there really going to be a place called Armageddon? Well, there is a place called Armageddon. It's the Valley of Megiddo. It's the Valley, the Jezreel Valley. It exists. It's there, okay? And so, and that's the place where they always did battle. And so you have to decide, is there really going to be a future battle called the Battle of Armageddon? Are all the nations going to, uh, to gather against this nation called Israel? Well, if you lived five, six hundred years ago, seven, eight hundred years ago, when there was no Israel, and you read this, you would say what? Well, how could this be? There is no nation of Israel. God what? Destroyed the nation of Israel. He, 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 they're all gone, and so therefore, so they, they begin then to, to doubt the Word of God and become up with other, what? Theologies to explain us away. And so, as some of you have said, but this doesn't make any sense, at least since 1948, people should be, have realized that they were wrong and should realize that, wow, look, God, what? Brought back the nation of Israel. And I can't explain for everybody else, okay? But it's easy now for us to live in what? Hindsight being 2020, there is what? The nation of Israel. God did exactly what he stated. And we haven't ever gone to Hosea chapter 6. I don't have time to do all that. But in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, God says, He says, On the second day, I will revive my people. On the third day, I will restore her. Okay? It was prophetic. So if a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. God's basically saying that after a period of approximately 2,000 years, He would revive His people. And on the third, the beginning of the third day, he would restore them to power. Well, when is Israel really going to be the world power again? When Christ reigns on the seat of David. When Yahweh himself, Zechariah chapter 2, he declares that he's going to come. He's going to live in their midst. 
We looked at Isaiah 48. It's kind of fun stuff, you know, where, where the Trinity, the triunity of God is all through the Old Testament, through the prophets, okay? And Yahweh declares that he himself is going to come. He's going to live in their midst and he's going to reign in their midst. They're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. It's exciting stuff. We don't have time to go through all of it today in just this real quick little review, okay? But as we saw it, literal interpretation is huge then, okay? If you believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, there are things you can't avoid, whether you believe it or like it or not. Progressive revelation. You believe that God has has continually revealed more and more information. So as we've gone through the dispensations over the last couple of weeks, okay, we see how God revealed something to Adam, and then clearly there must have been more that he gave to, to Noah and such, right? And more to, to Abraham, more to Moses, more on then through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, okay? Which we're going through in the, the Sunday school. And we see more and more information that God has revealed. Even now to us, in the New Testament, Paul declares about the church being a what? What's, what's Paul called the church? It's a what? A mystery, thank you. All right, somebody's paying attention. Good. All right. it, it was a mystery, but it was. Okay? It, that, 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 to them, they didn't understand it. Paul says, but God gave me what? Special revelation. Okay? And I'm declaring it, and he gave it to me so I could give it to you. Okay? But the indicators of it were all in the Old Testament. It was just a what? A mystery. Okay? And now the mystery is being revealed. Okay? So it's kind of fun stuff. Okay? And so we see how this goes on. The glory of God. That... God's purpose is for his own glory. The salvation of man is very important, but the, honestly, God doesn't exchange his glory so man can be saved. Man is saved to the glory of God. Do you get it? It's a very important statement there, okay? And then finally, the distinction between Israel and the church, which we see all through the scriptures, but again, and again, if you take this literally, you can't avoid it. They kind of hang together, okay? So, We've been looking at that. We considered that. We considered the definition of it as well. But then we began to look at these, what are considered to be the seven classic dispensations. And you're going to see, if you have a sermon note sheet, I come kind of adding to it today a little bit, okay? But we saw, as we went through, there, that there are three primary groupings. There's the before Israel, there's the during Israel, and then there's the kind of, I don't want to say post-Israel, because that sounds like I'm getting rid of Israel, but this mystery portion, okay, where Israel's kind of set aside, okay? And so we have... Before Israel, Israel, and then that mystery portion, okay? And I said, when we get into this kingdom age, you're going to see there's kind of this quasi-also thing going on here as well. And that's where we're going to see here, boop, we pop up this little F slash G on your, you know. So you got A through G, and I haven't shown you the F, through, F slash G the whole way through, but here it is, F slash G, because I don't want to call it, you know, F.5 or whatever, you know, it's just... It's just kind of there. It's kind of between what everybody says. But it's the 70th week of Daniel's vision. It's commonly referred to as the tribulation period. There's a lot of debate even about the tribulation period. But again, I feel like, man, if you just read God's word and you take it literally, take it for what it says, it's really not very hard. In fact, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, Noah do you remember this one? The blessed verse, the read verse? Revelation 1 3, blessed are. You remember it? Can you say it real loud? And continue. Is my right? No, I'm saying it wrong. And keep it. Okay, and keep it. Okay. For the time is. The time is at hand, okay? So, so the beginning of the book of Revelation, right at the very beginning, we're told, blessed are those who what? Read and those who hear the words of this prophecy, right? Why? Time's at hand. It's coming. Okay, the Lord's at hand. So, the book of Revelation, we kind of look at it like, a, like a, oh, I don't know. It's so hard to understand. It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be hard to understand. You just have to believe what? God meant what he said. If you think it's all symbology... If you think it's all allegory, then it's going to be very hard to understand. Because why? You've got to decide what, what means what. But if you believe that God really meant what he said and said what he meant, and you just take it, then a lot of things just kind of really fit together. They make sense. 
there are going to be these many nations and there's going to be these many kings. And, and so when we get to the, the, seven, the seven heads of the beast, and then there's really eight heads, but the seven heads of the beast are the seven empires that are going to rule the world. It all makes sense. You know, there was Egypt, there was Assyria, there was Babylon, or there was Egypt, yeah, Assyria, then Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome. Ha, huh, the five that were, then there's going to be one that's for a short period of time. Anyways, it all kind of it fits together. It's just, it's all there, you know? And so it's nothing that's really hard for us to comprehend. We just have to believe that God gave us his word for us to understand it. It's a matter of faith. And as we go through this, if you remember, the whole way through here, the responsibility of the test is really all the same. Though it's, it's, there's, there's specific stuff, the responsibility of the test in every single one of these dispensations or stewardships has been the same. You just have to believe God by faith. By faith, you have to believe what God has said, and you have to do what? Obey Him. Faith without works is dead. And so... So Abraham, we're told back here in promise, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Wait a second. What did he believe? Does anybody remember in Genesis 15 what what Abraham believed? Did did, did God come to Abraham and say, I'm going to send my son Jesus. He's going to die on a cross and he's going to pay for the penalty of your sins. Is that what he believed? No. What does it say? Because Paul takes this and he brings it into Romans chapter 3. And Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he became the father of faith. What is it that Abraham believed? That God would give him a son. And his descendants would be numerous as a sand. Do you get it? He believed God. It, it's, it's a mindset. It's a total mindset. People always say, what, do people, what does someone need to believe in order to be saved? Do they need to believe that Jesus is God? I mean, how much... Inf- well, no. Here's the deal. Will they ultimately believe that when they're taught that, if they truly believe God? The answer is yes. So do they need to believe that in order to be saved? The answer is no. They just need to know that salvation is where? In God. And only in God. I mean, I remember when I crawled, I rolled out of my bed. God, if you can say this wicked soul, I'm yours. I didn't give a big theological treatise about what I believed. I didn't have a statement of faith. Does that make sense? I just knew that I was a sinner going to hell and that God was the only one who could what? Save me. I didn't know all the, the details. I mean, I grew up in a church, and so I knew Jesus died on the cross and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't know all the, the finite details of, of what all happened on the cross. and everything. I didn't need to know that. All I needed to know was what? God was is, always shall be, and he's the only one who can save me. And I was willing to what? Be that empire penguin and follow him. Get it? That's what salvation's all about. And if you really have faith in God, then what's going to happen? You'll, you'll continue to grow in his truth. You grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You get it? And so... When I read the God's word then, and I find out that Jesus is actually God, what happens? I just believe it. I just accept it, because God said it. Does that make sense? Okay, so... So anyways, we come into the 70th week then, okay? That's where we, where we want to start today, in this 7 slash G, okay? And we're going to move quickly through this, okay? And, and, um, and go through this thing, um, and so this is going to be the whirlwind, whirlwind tour here, okay? So the initial event that starts this 70th week of Daniel's vision. I've got to step back for a moment. Let's go back to the book of Daniel, okay? We're going to jump into the book of Revelation, but we're going to go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, okay? And I have it up here. You can go back in your Bibles. You can check it out as well. And in Daniel, chapter 9, this is where we talk about this, this 70 weeks of Daniel's vision. It's very important, okay? Because, again, progressive revelation, Okay? So the things that God reveals later is built upon the foundation of the stuff that he's revealed earlier. Okay? He's the same yesterday as he is today as he will be forever. He didn't change. Okay? So the, rev- the revelation and the prophecies that he declared before still hold true. So we go back to Daniel, Daniel's vision. Okay? And Daniel is praying. Okay? And he's fasting and he's praying. And God sent 
an angel to come give him wisdom and illumine his mind. Okay, it took a while for the angel to get there, but finally the angel gets there and he says to him, he says, um, Daniel says, now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. Now this is very important, okay? Context is important. Daniel's speaking and he's praying and he's confessing his sin in who? The sin of his people Israel. Okay? He's very specific here. He names a what? A nation. Okay? So he's confessing the sin of his people Israel, presenting my supplication before Yahweh, my God, okay? for the holy mountain of my God. So, so what's he talking about there? He's talking about Israel, and he's talking about what? Jerusalem. Okay? Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Okay? It's the mountain of his God, because okay? that's where the temple of God would be. Okay? So remember those when we come down later. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. How cool would that be, huh? Man, how I yearn to hear that from God, you know? I mean, I know I am. But how cool would that be to have an angel from the presence of God say, Daniel... Look, God loves you so much, he sent me to specifically come and talk to you. How cool is that? And so he says, um, you're greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks. How many? Seven. Do you think that means it literally? We'll find out. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Now, you need to understand the word in the Hebrew here. Actually, for weeks is the word sevens. Okay? So, so get rid of the weeks for a moment and just put in sevens. Seventy sevens are determined for your people in your holy city. Okay? So, the reason we started up here in context, who are his people and where is his holy city? It's Israel and Jerusalem. Get the context, okay? So, what Gabriel is going to give him is for who? It's for Israel and Jerusalem. It's assuming that you're taking this what? Literally. Literally, Okay. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay, The term anoint, again, is pouring the oil. The word Messiah or Messiah is the Hebrew word, which means anointed one. It brings over into the Greek as the word Christos, which we understand in English as Christ. Okay, So the anointing of the most holy one. Okay? Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Okay, stop for a moment. Okay, so from the command to rebuild, restore Jerusalem. Okay, so we're talking about the decree of Artaxerxes. Okay, Artaxerxes is the one, biblically, who decreed that Israel would be what? Rebuilt. Okay, so... Historically, it's out there, okay? That from the, the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Who's Messiah the Prince? Jesus. So from the time of the command to rebuild Jerusalem until Jesus, there shall be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. The street shall be built again, the wall, even the troublesome time. And after the sixty-two sevens, Messiah shall be cut off. What do you think Messiah shall be cut off means? Take it literally. He's going to be killed. He's going to be crucified. So, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the crucifixion of Christ, till whoever Messiah is going to be at this moment, because he hasn't been here yet, but we understand 2020, right? Till the cutting off of Messiah, there's going to be 62 sevens. Okay? If those sevens are years, seven years, 62 Okay, um, I'm sorry, 62 and 7. So 69 sevens is 483 years. Interestingly enough, you do chronologies. Okay, The Bible gives you enough information to do chronologies, and, hi- and, and history gives you enough. Do you know how many years, and this is approximate because of all the datings and stuff like that, okay? Do you know how many years there are approximately between the, the decree of Artaxerxes and, and, the, and, the, and the crucifixion of Christ? 483. Do you think it's coincidental? No. There's nothing coincidental. That's exactly right. God had decreed this way out. Okay, but now look. God told him that up here, there are how many weeks? 
there are 70 sevens. But down here, we used up what? 69 of them. That meant that there's still what? One seven left, okay? So it says, then, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So Messiah is not going to die for himself. Who did he die for? Us. Us. But not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come, so now we have another prince. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, that is that people, the, the prince who's come to come, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one seven. But in the middle of the seven, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomin- abomination shall, blah, 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 shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So, we're told that there then is going to be this prince of the people who's going to come in the future, okay? Who's going to do what? He's going to make a covenant. He's going to make a covenant for seven years. A seven-year covenant. Okay? But we're not told when it's going to be. We're just told that it's going to be what? In the distant future. And then Paul tells us there's a what? This mystery that's unfolding, right? And Jesus talks about it in Luke 24, remember? There was a time of the... Gentiles, until the, so that the Jerusalem would be trampled on until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Okay, So we have this, this gap, this mystery zone that God hadn't shared with them then, but was going to share with them later on. But he gives us enough of it to let us know that there's a what? A planned interim between the 69 and the 70th. Okay? When we get into Revelation, this is very important. When we get into Revelation, we're going to see the 70th week. Okay? It begins in Revelation chapter 11. Okay? And so that's the, that final week that we're actually talking about, the final seven years. And so when we, last week, we looked at Revelation 10 as the final act of the church age. And if you remember in verse 7 of Revelation 10, it says, But in the days of the sounding of the final trumpet, or the seventh angel, when he was about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. And again, if you believe the mystery of God is the church, from Ephesians chapter 3, okay, it's very clear, in Revelation, or Romans chapter 11, Paul uses the term for it there as well. If the mystery is the church, then we're talking about the church being perfected and completed at that point in Rome, Revelation chapter 10. Okay, so you can look in your Bible here, okay, in Revelation chapter 10, if you're looking there, okay, and I'll have the, the opportunity to put it all here, there's only a couple verses now, at the, to the end of chapter 10. And immediately we go into chapter 11, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, okay, after chapter 10 we go into chapter 11, okay, and if I'm reading the book, kind of chronologically as I go through, then I'm told that within the same period of time, when the seventh angel is about to sound, okay, the church is completed, and then the next thing, other than... John being told to eat the book and it being sweet in his mouth and bitter in his belly, okay? The next thing that we're told is right here in Revelation chapter 11. And then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure what? The temple of God, the altar and those who were worshipped there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they shall tread the holy city. So we have the temple of God, right? Whose temple is that? Israel's, and it's in the holy city. Where's the holy city? Jerusalem, okay? Kind of remember Daniel's vision here, okay? And they're going to tread it underfoot for 42 months. What is 42 months? Three and a half years. And if you don't get it from that point, look what happens next. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. Do you know what 1,260 days are? Three and a half years, okay? So, there's going to be a period of time here for what? Three and a half years, okay? This is the beginning of that, that final week, that final seven, okay? And remember, there, that prince is going to come, and the prince is going to do what? He's going to make a covenant for what? Seven years. So, we're not told, okay, right in here, in this little gap part, but there must be what going on in the nations? A lot of politics going on, Okay? And so, whoever this prince is going to be is going to come, and he's going to do what? He's going to make a covenant with Israel for seven years. 
part of that covenant is going to be allowing them to do what? Rebuild the temple. Do you believe there's going to be a temple in Jerusalem? I do. I don't think it's just a hope. I know. I know. Because I have it on good authority that the temple is going to be rebuilt. Where it's going to be rebuilt, are they going to wipe out the Dome of the Rock and build it right there? Or are they going to build it on the southern portion? People want to debate this. I don't really care about the debates. What I know is going to happen is it's going to be built. It's going to be built. And, and, and there's going to be a powerful figure in the world just prior to it who is going to promote it and allow it and, 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 and cause it to be so. Okay? And he's going to be the one who comes in place of Messiah. Okay? In place of the Christ. Okay? These are, these two guys, these two witnesses, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anybody wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. Now listen to what these two witnesses are able to do. See if you can figure out who they are. I'm not saying definitively who they are, but we're kind of given a little bit of um, evidence here, okay? These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of the prophecy. Does that sound like anybody? Elijah. Did Elijah ever die? What happened to Elijah? He was taken on a whirlwind. He was raptured. Huh. Okay. Well, go there a second. And they have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Who does that sound like? Moses. Moses. Okay. Now, exactly. So Enoch walked with God and he was no more, right? So this de- debate between whether it's uh, Elijah and Enoch, okay, or whether it's Elijah and Moses, okay? Was anybody there when Moses died? God was. God killed him. God told him to go up the mountain Pisgah and look on the, on the promised land because he wouldn't see it again. And so he died right there and God what? God buried him, okay? That's what it says. It, and so, and at the Mount of Transfiguration, we'll get there in a few months from now because going through the book of Matthew, who knows how many years from now it'll get there. But anyways, um, but in the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration, who does he meet? Elijah and Moses, okay? So, apparently, uh, Moses and Elijah are coming back, y'all. Okay? And they're going to have the power. Do you believe it? I do, because I believe the Bible was literal. Make sense? You've got to make a decision. Do you believe what the Bible says is true? So, they're going to come back, and they're going to have these things going on, okay? The world's going to see them, but the world's going to reject it. We don't have time to continue on with what's going to go on, but the world's going to reject their, their ministry, Okay? At the end of the three and a half years, this prince, you can continue reading Revelation 11, okay, this prince is going to break his covenant, okay, and he's going to kill these, um, God's going to allow him to be able to kill these two witnesses. They're going to lay him out in the street for three and a half days. There are going to be webcams on them, at least from our perspective today, right, because it says the whole world's going to see him, and the world, whole world's going to have a party. You know, years ago, 40 years ago, now I've got to remember, okay, background. My undergrad worked computer science. I went to Carnegie Mellon University. It was number three in the country in computers, okay? Is when I was a junior is when we first had monitors. I mean, I was at one of the top schools in the country, and I was still using the, the telegraph machine, you know? Okay? It was kind of fun stuff. I can't imagine what's all gone in my day. So back in those days, if you had said that every eye was going to see them, you'd be like, how's that going to happen? It'd be like saying Israel's going to become a nation again, right? But now it's on. We got what? We got webcams every place. I mean, you could see almost, see, you can watch eagles, man, you know, up in the, they got webcams up in trees. I mean, you know, they're everywhere. So every eye, do you, it's, it's no wonder in my brain at all that the whole world's going to be having a party over the death of these two prophets of God. But at the end of three and a half days, guess what's going to happen? The spirit of, the spirit of life's going to come back into them. They're going to stand up. Could you imagine being there, kicking them, and all of a sudden, talking about the night of the living dead. Anyways, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about horrific in your brain, because if you have that mindset, right? But God's going to use it one more time as a final testimony of these people. The, the rapture of the church is going to be a sign, the final sign, but then you're going to have these two witnesses that are going to be killed, and they're going to come back to life. 
They're going to be resurrected in the, in the face of everybody. They're not going to be in a tomb where nobody's going to be able to see it. They're going to be on the street. They're going to be raised up, and they're going to go, bam, up in the, in the clouds, and every eye is going to see it. And people are going to have to make a decision. Do they believe it then or not? Sadly is, people are going to what? They're going to believe the lie. That's exactly right. They're going to reject it. Just like when the, when the church is taken up, snatched away, they're going to believe the lie. Why? Because there's still going to be a church on the earth. Only those who genuinely believe Jesus Christ. Okay? There's a, sadly, there's a lot of people, and I know this sounds really like um, cultic, but it, it's, this is what God's Word says. There are going to be a lot of people who aren't genuine. I, I went to church for years and I didn't believe in Jesus. I just went to church. And there's going to be a lot of people going to church. The church isn't going away. The church is going to be taken away. Does that make sense? The, the organization is still going to exist on the earth. And there's going to be a lot of people who say, well, it can't have been the rapture, because if it was the rapture, I wouldn't be here, would I? Oh, yeah, that's true. You would be gone. Well, maybe not. You know, We don't know who's all genuine. Okay. So, anyways, so the responsibility and test in this time we're told is going to be to worship God, okay? That they're going to accept Christ as their Savior or to worship God. But we're told in Revelation 13, I don't have time to go through all this, okay? You can read this, but this is going to be the period where people are going to have to make a decision. They're either going to worship the beast or they're going to worship God. If you choose to worship the beast, okay, then you're going to have the mark of the beast put upon you. If you choose not to worship the beast, you're not going to be able to receive the mark. Without the mark, you're not going to be able to buy and sell. I mean, it's just very clear. It's very... Very consistent, okay? And those who don't receive the mark, okay, as we then see in Revelation chapter 20, are going to be killed. They're going to be beheaded, okay? It's, if you don't receive the mark, you're going to have to have, okay, this is, now, understand, Revelation 10, the church has already been taken up. I believe I'm not going to be here for this. Make sense? I'm not worried about what the mark of the beast is, because it's not going to be around in my day. Okay? However, consumer beware, if you don't accept Christ as your Savior beforehand, and you're not taken up, you need to know this stuff. Okay, Because I believe there's going to be a lot of people saved right after the, right after the rapture, and when, when that temple happens. Because I believe there's a lot of people who probably know the Bible who just aren't, what, committing their life to it. And all of a sudden they're going to see it, and they're going to say, what? Oops, I blew it. And they're going to give their life to Christ. And so I think that there's going to be a church that exists. Okay, God always has a what? A remnant, and clearly there are people who are going to be doing what? Not accepting the mark of the beast. Make sense? Okay? And they're going to die for their faith. That's exactly right, okay? And that's really going to be the test. Do you believe God, or do you believe the world? Okay? It's always the same. It always plays out. By faith, by faith, by faith. So these people who, who weren't saved prior to it, but go into this troublesome time, right? Now all of a sudden they believe, and now by faith, what are they going to have to do? By die. They're going to die. They're going to reject the mark by faith, okay? And they potentially are going to have to die. Now, potentially there may not be some that have to die. Maybe they have some clandestine thing. But we know that, that the beast is going to be totally against them. The beast is going to be seeking to destroy them. He's going to be seeking to kill them. And we're told then in Revelation 20, what Chuck read just a little bit ago, that, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and the judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. People always talk about the church reigning with Christ. What I see in God's word about those who are going to reign with Christ in a thousand years are the martyrs of that seven years. I don't read about any of us being there. Okay? I don't know how that will play out. I'm just saying literally. Okay, I'm not into theologies that build things and, 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 and put us places that the Bible doesn't say we are. Okay? If you find out that the church, even before the rapture, is, is going to be these people in here, then let me know it. Okay? But I don't know of that passage. Okay? And so I only want to believe what the Bible teaches. Make sense? I hope I'm there in the millennium too. I, mean, I could be outside the Jerusalem and I could be up in some peanut gallery watching, looking down. I'm okay with any of it. Make sense? But I just this is what God says about those who are literally living in Jerusalem and reigning with him, okay? And so we have that. But then the final event in this portion, okay, is the Battle of Armageddon, okay? And so during the seven years, what's going to happen is that the nations are going to progressively get worse and worse, and they're going to 
God's going to be trying to get a hold of them with his bowls of wrath. They're not going to listen. And so the, 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 we're told here that the um, three, three um, uh, spirits, false spirits, that come out of the, the mouth of the, the beast and the, the prophet and the... Um, ugh, my mind's blanking out. Anyways, they raise up... I think it's in, on, your, on your bulletin, actually, right here. It says, And now the three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet... And they go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to, to battle that great day of God Almighty. And they gather them together to a place which is called in Hebrew Armageddon. And so then we come into Revelation 19. That's Revelation 16 in the bulletin. And this is Revelation 19. And so now they've gathered the, the nations together. And so then Jesus comes down on a white horse, tattooed, tattooed on his thigh, is faithful and true. Anybody know it in the Hebrew? Chesed Nemet. Good job. Okay? Chesed Nemet. That's exactly right. He is plumb and he is level. Okay? He is faithful and he is true. Whatever he does is correct. He's Chesed Nemet. Okay? He's the king of the kings and lord of lords. And he's going to come down and he's going to make, a, he's going to make war against the, the, the nations. And out of his mouth is going to go a two-edged sword and boom! It's going to be over. Then we get into Revelation 20 where we have then the beginning of the kingdom, okay? And i got to move quickly here. We have the return of Christ at the battle of Armageddon. That begins this thing, okay? But we're told that any of the nations um, who weren't there, because there are going to be people who weren't at the battle of Armageddon, and those nations move forward into the millennial kingdom. Now this is, we got to realize this, okay? A lot of times we think of the millennial kingdom as all saved people being living in there. It's not. It's all the nations who survived Armageddon that go into the millennial reign. Who's going to rule? God, Jesus, but God himself in the flesh, Yahweh himself is going to come and he's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. Okay? And I got a lot of verses there from Zechariah. You can look at those, okay? I don't have time to go through all of them. Maybe tonight, if you come for care group and we have time, we can go through some of that stuff, okay? But, but you can see then that he comes down, okay? And, and he conquers the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, okay? And so we get into this, um, this time um, of this thousand-year reign, and there is one thing that the people need to do during this thousand year reign. And I want you to think about what they've got to do. It comes from Zechariah chapter 14, verses 16 to 19. Okay, final chapter of the book of Zechariah. And we read, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh Sabaoth, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They're going to keep the Feast of what? Tabernacles. That's a what? Well, it's a tent, but it's a Jewish feast. And where are they going to go? To Jerusalem. Okay? And so we have this quasi-Israel thing going on here, okay? Where Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to sit on the throne of David, okay, who was the king of Israel, right? In in, In Jerusalem, which was the holy city of Israel, right? And they're going to celebrate this Jewish Israeli feast, but one specifically. Note it doesn't say, because if you remember, the Israelites had to come back how many times? Three times. Very good. They had to come back at Passover. They had to come back at Shavuot, which was Pentecost, which was the Feast of Weeks. And they had to come back at Sachath, which was Tabernacles. Okay? So there were three times a year when all the men of Israel were supposed to go back to Jerusalem. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Okay? Note, the nations don't have to gather for Passover. Isn't that interesting? The nations don't have to gather for the Feast of Weeks. The nations have to gather for tabernacles. What was the Feast of Tabernacles all about? Okay. You're, you're good. It's, it's, it's remembrance of the time in the desert. But there was something specific that the Feast of Tabernacles. There was God's provision. Okay. Okay. What happened the entire time that they were in the wilderness. God was with them. The pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. The presence of God 
God dwelt in their midst the entire time. We forget about that so many times because they, they, they rebelled, they murmured, they disputed. People say, oh, if only I could see God. Really? These people saw him every day and they still murmured and disputed. They still wanted to leave. It's amazing. And so now, so the Feast of Tabernacles was a remembrance. And the Jews understood it, and they put this great menorah in the, in the, in the court of the woman who would remind them of who God was. That's when Jesus, in John 12, I think it is, it's either John 8 or John 12. Anyways, where he says, I am the, the light of the world. That's what he's referring to. He's right there. And he says to them, basically he's telling them, look, I am. I'm it. That's what he said. It must have been John 8, because later in John 8, he then says, unless you believe I am, I am, you will die in your sins. And when you lift up the Son of the Man, Son of Man, you will know I am, I am. And then it's not till the end of the chapter when he says before Abraham was, I am, I am. And that's when they took up stones to what? To kill him. Jesus claimed to be Yahweh. He was God in the flesh. And here he's going to be amongst them, okay? He's going to be reigning. And so... This is the time then when all the nations will recognize and they will confess, every knee is going to bow, that's exactly right, that he is who? That he is God. Okay? And then, look what it says, and it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth, not that might happen, it shall be that, okay, whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh Sabaoth, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Yahweh strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so if a nation has a choice, God's not going to be there and compelling them, making them come. He's going to put out the command. This is it. You've got to come. So Egypt is used as the illustration, right? Egypt decides what? We're not going to go. We're not going to give them allegiance. So what's going to happen in the, in, the, in the country of Egypt? There will be no rain for the... Well, forget the plagues. It doesn't say that. Well, and they shall receive the plague. But the plague is no rain. Okay? There's going to be no rain for the entire year. Could you imagine that drought? I mean, even in times of drought, when we talk about drought, we still get what? Some rain. We just don't get enough rain, right? They're going to get... No room. No rain. Imagine if you did two or three years in a row. Okay? So it's their choice. But God's put it out. You don't come to tabernacles, I'm not going to give you rain. How cold is that, huh? Do you think there's going to be any nations that test that theory? And you know, it's not going to be the king who really has a, the king of that, that country who really has a whole lot to worry about, is it? It's going to be the people who deal with that. Just like it is today. So, so anyways, so that's a responsibility. The failure, though, is at the end of Revelation, as Chuck read this morning, we read that at the end of the thousand years, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. You know those people who believe in amillennialism? They believe that Satan is bound right now? Wow. I go, if, Satan, if this is what it's going to be like when Satan's bound, could you imagine if Satan's loosed? Anyways, and so, but at the end of the thousand years, so if during those thousand years, Satan is going to be bound, okay? So the flesh of man is going to be what's going to be causing all the sin, okay? But Satan is going to be released at the end of the thousand years, and he's going to be given the privilege to go ahead and deceive the nations one more time. A nation's only going to be deceived if what? Think about this. If they're willing to be deceived. A nation can only be deceived if they're willing to be deceived. Because if, if their eyes are on the Lord, God's going to what? He's going to protect them. But if their eyes aren't on God, and they want to be their own masters, then what will they do? They'll follow the lie. So at the end of the thousand years, he gets all the nations together one more time. Okay, Note, whose number is the sand of the sea. Could you imagine that after a thousand years of, of God literally reigning on the earth, that many people? They're going to rain, and they're going to surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire is going to come down from God, and he's going to wipe them out. And then he's going to have the, you can see the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night. How long? Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that there's annihilation. They don't want to face the fact of God's holy wrath. How long does hell last? 
forever and ever. It's a place of torment forever and ever. I don't, I'm not gloating in that. But I certainly don't want to see my family and my friends go there. And I don't want to see any of you go there. It's real. Just as heaven is real, hell is real. And so in the end, the final thing is that great white throne judgment. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was no found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing for God, and books were opened. What were opened? Books. Note the books, plural. Okay? And another book was opened. So I have this stack, then, of books that are here. But then I have this other book, singular. And I'm sure that these are tomes. I mean, it's just, just the, the books on Bob would be, like, massive. Because they're the books of my sins. I mean, I could imagine it's whole volumes. Okay? But over here is a singular book. Okay? We'll make it a, make it a nice book, a real book, though. Okay? In fact, we ought to just do this. Here we go. Amen, because it's the book of life. So you got all these books that are stacked, right? And it says, And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Every individual before the great white throne is going to come up, and they're going to be judged according to their works. You thought you were good enough. Let's find out. How sad that's going to be that day. Well, my good works outweigh my bad works. You're, do you know what you're wagering on that? All of eternity. There was a man named Blase Pascal. I like him because he was a mathematician. Anyways, and so, anyways, you can look him up. He's a great guy. Okay, Blase Pascal. He was a statistician as well, and he calculated this thing called uh, Pascal's wager. He calculated the probability that God existed versus the probability that God didn't exist. Do you know what happened? He got saved. <laughs> and all through math. Because the probability that God exists. You start, I mean, think about what we know now about our bodies and what we know about the universe. The probability that God exists versus the probability that it came out of Big Bang. Who's got greater faith? That's all i got to say. I came from a monkey? Really? Anyways, amazing stuff. Just remember, evolution is religion. Just as we say, by, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things that exist came from things that were not. So an evolutionist has to say, by faith they believe that the worlds were framed by a gaseous explosion, which no one ever saw, from gases which they have no idea where they came from. Make sense? Because if it came from a gaseous explosion, you have to explain where the gases came from, right? So then you have to explain what? So the reality is, in philosophy, there has to be an uncaused cause. And so what you put your faith in is that uncaused cause whether it's God or not God. It's religion. So science is looking at what exists and making determinations from it. Okay? So I have a hypothesis that God existed and created everything. That came from the Bible. Evolutionists have an hypothesis, not a theory. It's never been tested and proven. Don't fall into the trap of the theory of evolution. There's no such thing as a theory of evolution. It's a hypothesis of evolution. It's a thought process. It's a belief pattern. I believe that this is how it started. There, nobody was there. There's no record. Okay? Anyways, sorry. A little off track, but that's a big deal to me. Okay? So they're judged according to their works. They're willing to bet their eternity on it. And they were judged, each one according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Everybody's condemned. Everybody's condemned. Everybody is condemned based upon works. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Only when you give Christ your very life, no strings attached. God, if you can say this wicked soul, I'm yours. That's salvation. It's not by any works which I have done. It's all by the grace of God. Your name is then forever written in this book of life. It cannot be taken away. I mean, could you imagine this courtroom? Satan is there. Ha! 
She's guilty. And I get her blood. But Jesus says, Father, I have a petition to make. What is it, my son? I died for her sins? Well, son, I know that you died for the sins of the whole world. Yes, Father, but she has trusted in me. And I've made a covenant with her that my death is her death. Daughter, because you are my daughter, enter into my kingdom. How cool is that? So, we don't have time for these. Do you believe that what God has decreed will take place? Do you honestly believe it? It changes your life if you really do. Are there people that you know who do not know Christ and will experience the wrath of God? I'm talking about the first seven years of it. But then even the potential beyond. Have you sought to share the love of Christ with them? Are you committed to the message of Christ and ready, if necessary, to be sacrificed for him who sacrificed himself for you? We don't have no assurance that just, that just because there's going to be, um, I'm going to be raptured, I'm going to be snatched away, that I may not have to die for my faith before that. There are people around the globe who are dying for the name of Jesus Christ. In the end, then, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. We know that your word is true. It's quick, it's powerful, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And Lord, I know that you yourself are the word. And Lord, I just pray that you would help me to grow in your grace and knowledge. Lord, help me to be conformed to your image and likeness. And I pray the same for each individual here. Lord, if, if anyone's here, Lord, who doesn't know you, I pray that you would draw them to yourself. And Lord, that they would fall upon their knees. They would cry out in their own hearts to you. And, and Lord, you would... Cause them to be adopted, even at this moment, Lord, that they would become your child, that you would receive the glory in their lives. Lord, I pray for um, Dad and Judy and Mom and Bo, Lord, for their salvations. Lord, they don't know you. They just don't know they don't know you. And I pray that you would continue to draw them to yourself. And Lord, I know that there are many loved ones that are represented by the people here, Lord. I pray that we would be faithful to live the life of um, before them that you desire for us to live. And Lord, that we would be bold to proclaim your message of truth. Lord, help us to believe your word, that it is literal, that it is true. And Lord, that it would impact and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.